Thanks. Would you pray with me, please? Be with us this morning, God. Quiet our hearts. May our spirits be still, that we might hear from you. Amen. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at the heavens, when I look at the moon and the stars that you have established, I wonder, O God, what are human beings that you are mindful of us? Mortals that you care for us. Yet you have made us just a little lower than yourself, O God crowned us with glory and with honor. You have put all things under our feet. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That is Psalm 8. You, O oh God, the psalmist says, are mighty and majestic, and sovereign, and omnipotent. And we, the psalmist goes on, are so small, so limited, so finite, so contingent. Yet, he says, yet you have made us just a little lower than yourself. You've given us a status and a significance and a glory and a bearing that are truly unfathomable given our limited station. For we are nothing indeed in the grand scheme of creation, O God, yet because of you we are also everything. Yet. Yet. There's so much significance in this little conjunction in this psalm. This little conjunction signals a radical combination of two seemingly contradictory ideas. That one little word, yet. I begin this morning by quoting Psalm 8 and by pointing out the power of this little conjunction yet because I want ultimately to compare this with another powerful scripture and conjunction. That is, with another powerful scriptural paradox that in its seeming contradiction actually points us to the deepest possible truth concerning the nature of God and moreover to the deepest possible truth concerning our own nature as God's image bearers. But I'm not ready to do that. At least not yet. See what I just did there? Not yet. No, instead, I first want to tell you a story. And in saying that, I suppose it's not so much a story as it is a memory. It's the memory of my high school soccer coach, David Sanford, a man who left a deep impression on me, but a deep impression for far different reasons than I would have thought at the time. Now, for my point with all of this to be clear, I have to, though he would be uncomfortable with this, I have to front load for you information about why this coach was so objectively impressive. In other words, not just the memory of some young teenage boy. And I'll start with this. 
The man was the 1994 National High School Soccer Coach of the Year. I want to make sure you catch that. I said national, not conference, not region, not state, national, meaning the United States of America. I don't know how closely y'all follow these things, but they don't just give those out to people. As a young man in the 1980s, this coach, David Sanford, single-handedly created a soccer program at a small, upstart, private Christian school in sleepy little High Point, North Carolina. And within a decade, he had turned that program into one that soccer players from literally all over the state of North Carolina dreamed of being affiliated with. For year in and year out, this coach fielded nationally ranked soccer teams. Seven straight state championships through the 1990s, I think. His notoriety in the soccer community was therefore legendary. And consequently, there's no telling how many offers Coach Sanford received to coach at various major colleges and or professional clubs. I'm not exaggerating. There's also no way of expressing just how much awe he was held in by anyone who, in the 1990s, lived in North Carolina and was even remotely serious about the game of soccer. As a young soccer player, it was he whom you wanted to play for. And not only because you knew that he was going to bring out the best of your abilities, which you did know, but more significantly still, because you knew that he was the one who was going to be able to facilitate your opportunity to play at the colleges that you wanted to play for. In short, the man was connected and he was revered. So that, you have to understand, was what at the time I thought most impressed me about him. In other words, his status and his resume and his connections and his power. But then my senior year of high school, something truly remarkable happened. As we began that season, at a time when he was in his prime, late 40s, early 50s, I have to imagine, he announced that he'd be retiring at the end of the year. And when asked why, he would demur and just say, it's time. He would say that he still loved the game, sure, but that he wanted to be able to dedicate more time to his family, and to various ministry opportunities with and through his church, and to simply be able to be present to other joys that a quiet, simple life might bring. That's what he'd say. And to say that we were all flabbergasted by this decision, just completely dumbfounded, would be a tremendous overstatement. For there was so much more potential we all thought. So much more he could win, so much more he could do, so much more he could achieve, so many more accolades that he could add to his list. Why give it all up? Why now? We literally could not fathom it. But here's the other thing you have to know about this coach. One of the things that, in fact, set him apart from so many other successful coaches and leaders I've known through the years. He was also one of the most centered people I've ever met. He was a person of utter poise, of calm, of a quiet joy, of peacefulness, contentment. Always. He was never rushed. He was never anxious. He was never over or under bearing. He was just graceful. 
Looking back, life just seemed to flow forth from him. And I don't mean by that life as a kind of exuberance or charisma. I mean instead something much more fundamental. I mean life in the sense of just steadiness and assurance and dependability like the very air that we all breathe. In short, what I'm trying to get across is that you have to understand that this man was the model of what we would say biblical humility looks like. And so I tell you all of this so as to say, all of these years later, I now realize that what this coach was impressing upon me all those years was not his stature, and his power and his connections and his prestige, as I thought were the things impressing me at the time. No, I now realize that what this coach was impressing upon me was the fundamental power of humility, which is to say was the way that sincere humility anchors a life and enlarges a soul and enables one to be awash with joy and meaning and purpose in life. You see, I've followed this coach quietly through the quarter century since he made that decision. And it's clear to me, it's clear to anyone else who happens to be watching, that never once has he regretted leaving everything behind, all of that status and notoriety, all of that possibility to keep achieving. It's just demonstrably obvious that he has never regretted leaving that behind to settle into a quieter, simpler life. Yet what's become clear to me over the years was that the reason that he could walk away from a game like this was because he was playing all the while an entirely different game. That he had all the while been driven by entirely different things than most of the rest of us daily are. And so the lesson that I've taken from all of this and the lesson that I'm trying to impress upon all of us this morning is that as paradoxical as it may sound, the way to secure a true and lasting sense of worth and significance and wholeness and contentment as human beings. In other words, the way of securing that which we all yearn and strive daily for is not, as we tend to think it is, through the steady accumulation of worldly power and success, but is instead through the certain acceptance of our innate smallness and limitation as human beings. Through humility. Therefore, that's the other conjunction I told you that I wanted to bring to your attention this morning. Therefore, it's right there at the crux of Philippians 2, 5 through 11, that which we in the Christian church call the Christ hymn. It's right there at the heart of it. And like that conjunction yet, this conjunctive adverb combines two seemingly contradictory ideas. I want you to listen for it now as I read this exquisite poem about the nature of Christ Jesus, our Lord, the incarnate God. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, the Apostle Paul writes. Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the very form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but who instead emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in human likeness, and then being found in human form, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore God hath highly exalted his name and has given him the name that is above every name 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did you hear it in there? That little word? That little conjunctive adverb? Therefore, right there in the middle, combining these two seemingly dissonant ideas. Because Jesus so fully humbled himself, he was therefore highly exalted. Therefore, for this reason. It looks like a logical contradiction that through humility one might, in fact, experience exaltation. Yet in that therefore lies the paradox that unlocks the key to being most fully human. I said earlier that this scripture and that this paradox reveals for us not only the deepest truth about our own nature as God's image-bearing creations, but also about the ultimate nature of God himself. And here now is why I say that. Many biblical and Greek scholars point out that the clause that begins this exquisite passage, the clause, Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, many biblical and Greek scholars point out that a more direct translation of this Greek word that is here translated as though is in fact because. Which means that a more Faithful interpretation might read Christ Jesus, who because he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but humbled himself and on and on and on. Do you understand and follow the point? In other words, Paul was making the case that Jesus, that God incarnate, didn't just decide to humble himself even though he had all the glory and power and might that one could possess. Instead, Paul is making the case that Jesus humbled himself because he had all the power and the glory and the might. In other words, Paul is pointing out that humility is central to the very identity of creator God. That God's power derives out of God's humility and that God's humility paradoxically gives God the quintessence of his power. Because he was in the very form of God, he humbled himself. Therefore, it follows he has been highly exalted. Therefore, humility and exaltation, exaltation and humility can't have the one without the other. Not because God arbitrarily chooses to do it this way, but because this is the way that it is at the very heart of God's being. Which brings me back now to my high school soccer coach and to what I now realize was the true impression that he was making on me all those years ago. And I have no doubt on all of us who were fortunate enough to play for him through the years. It wasn't his success or his notoriety or his prestige, or anything else that made him so great and that drew others to him like a moth to a flame. It was his humility that drew us to him. 
But then paradoxically, it was on account of his humility that he was daily deriving the bearing of worth and wholeness and peace that we ourselves were so attracted to and that we ourselves hoped to one day gain for ourselves, seemingly, we thought, through gaining the success and being as sought after as he was. In other words, what impressed me all those years ago, I now see, was the paradox. Was the yet at the heart of this man. Was the therefore. And that, in the end, is what Paul is trying to convey to the Philippians through our epistle lesson for today just as that is what is at the heart of this majestic poem in Psalm chapter 8. Paul, like the psalmist, wants us to see that there is a paradox at the very heart of creation. And moreover, he wants us to see that the paradox is there at the heart of creation because the paradox was first there at the heart of the Creator Himself. Yes, if anyone has any reason to have confidence in the flesh, Paul writes, I assure you I have more. Yet whatever gains I had, these I count as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Yet, therefore, paradox all the way through. Oh, dear family, in a world where the tempter tries to seduce us each wilderness day with false offers of kingdoms and powers and glories galore, let us have in us the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, which is the same mind that was in the Apostle Paul, And as the same mind that was in my old high school soccer coach, and as the same mind that is at the heart of the very creation itself, the mind, that is, that knows and that trusts, that exaltation comes always through humility, and that humility leads ever onward toward exaltation. Yes, paradox upon paradox, all the way down. Yet, therefore, the wonder of all creation. And so again we ask, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen.